Hi, this is Frid from the Drive Syntax and English in Color. Today, I want to talk to you about some basics that you need when you want to learn the art and craft of parsing sentences. And in this video, I also want to explain um, my color parsing method. Well, at least give you a sound introduction to it. Um, and so this video is a little bit of background info for my freebie. You know, I offer a variety of freebies. Um, when you go to my websites, you'll see them. And one of these freebies is um, a set of overviews of main class patterns that English has. And in order to really appreciate the thinking behind those overviews, you need to understand what I'm going to unfold in this video. Yes, there is so much that I want to share about this, and it is so difficult to um, to put this all into one video. Well, it's impossible to put it all into one video, but it's so hard for me to choose because I want to share so much. So I'll try to stick to the basics, and I will make more videos. And I also want to say that if you are really thrilled about this, you could buy my book. The Joy of Syntax and the Zen of Grammar Practice. And in it, I present all of English syntax in color, and then I connect that to real issues of style and to real poems and real life texts and to critical thinking and also to an introduction to composition. So let me go ahead and share my screen. And here we go. So class elements, main class patterns, and predicate positives are the focus of this little presentation. If you have questions about this, please pop them into the comment section below and I will try to answer them. Well, it'll be easy right now because I don't get many comments yet because I'm a newbie in the YouTube world. Um, I hope that I will get to the point where there are so many comments that I cannot possibly answer them all. <laughs> but right now, you, you will get an answer if you comment. Okay, so here is some Grammar Nerd Alert. This is going to be a little bit longer even though I'm trying to keep, keep it short. And I recommend that you get a good snack, a vegan snack preferably, and that you settle down and try to be really comfortable. All good things take a long time and you're at the beginning of your journey probably. Okay, so first I want to remind you of these concepts and they seem so simple and they are in some ways, but the problem is that different people define them differently. And in this context, I would like to remind you that definitions are not truth statements, but are tools. There are cognitive tools or mental tools that we use in order to communicate about issues with one another and also that we use to actually perceive things in this world. And I have a lot more to say about that topic, and I won't now. <laughs> I'll just move on and try to remind you of some possible ways of defining the following terms. Words, phrases, clauses, and sentences. Words. Okay, what are words? Well, there are many ways, as I said, of defining them, and people often fight over that. I don't want to fight with anyone. Words are those entities that we find in dictionaries. And uh, remember that I really like um, Oxford, the Oxford Advanced Learner's Dictionary and Merriam-Webster's Dictionaries. And when you open them up, you will find words. They are entities that are fixed sound units um, and or fixed combinations of sounds and, and their representations in writing. And they have meaning potential. And in this context, I want to remind you that words don't have meaning, but have meaning potential. Words need to be, to be put into a context, which is usually created with the help of syntax. And, um, and then 
with the help of syntax, they enter into a relationship with each other and with a situation, with a narrative situation, and then they can mean something. And um, here I have given you examples of different types of words that, um, that actually represent different parts of speech. Dogs are nouns, she, pronoun, nice, adjective, be, verb, yes, adverb, always, adverb, into <clears throat> preposition and conjunction out interjection. And different grammars and different dictionaries differ a little bit with regard to how they define and categorize these word classes, but those are word classes that are commonly used and ultimately we got the idea for this type of categorization system from Latin grammars. Phrases. <clears throat> Traditionally, phrases are defined as two or more words that together um, perform a function but do not have the structure of a subject predicate relationship <clears throat> and phrases do not predicate something they are not complete thoughts they are uh, there are elements that can be seen to serve some function and i've written down a few examples my lovely fur baby is a noun phrase a piece of yummy vegan chocolate is a noun phrase very nice, nice is an adjective phrase, behind the tree, a prepositional phrase, should have been running, a verb phrase, very quickly, an adverb phrase. Much more can be said about phrases and how they are used differently in different grammar concepts and models, but today this is enough. Clauses. In English, we can distinguish between clauses and sentences. In German, that's not easily done because um, the, the word clause is translated as Satz and the word sentence is translated as Satz, which I think is a bummer <laughs> because I think this distinction is very useful. A clause is a syntactic construction that has subject and a predicate. A predicate is always headed by a finite verb form at least when it's a finite predicate, and then often other elements are contained in it. And semantically, it is whatever is said about the subject. Well, of course, the story is more complicated than that because there are different kinds of subjects, but, also, but that's also a story for another day. And I tell a lot of it in my book. <laughs> I, need to, I need to market it a little bit. I really like my book. Okay, so I love my dog Rudolph is an example of a main clause. It is also an example of a sentence because it starts with a capital letter and ends with an end punctuation mark. But it is a sentence that contains, uh, that consists of, pardon me, consists of a main clause. Then there are adverbial subclauses. Here is an example, because I love him. Uh, then I have an example of a relative clause, whom I love. And an example of that clause, which is a type of nominal clause, that I love him. Um, it's so remarkable, I think, that English, which, which is such a big language with so many words and, you know, <laughs> endless possibilities um, of <coughs> expressing ideas, has a very limited number of syntactic structures. There are only three types of clauses, main clauses, subclauses, reduced clauses, and there are only three kinds of main clauses, roughly speaking, and then there, there are three types of subclauses, namely adverbial, relative, uh, adverbial clauses, relative clauses, and nominal clauses. Um, but this is not the focus of today's presentation. I just uh, want to remind you of that. Now, while a, the, a clause is a structure with a subject and a predicate, a sentence can be that, but can also be something else. Um, what a clause, <coughs> excuse me, and a sentence have in common is that they express a complete thought. Um, a sentence can consist of just one word, however, but a one-word sentence is different from just a word. If I enumerate words like books, here, now, then, 
that's not, those are not one word sentences. They don't mean anything. But if I say, help, I'm actually uttering a thought. I'm saying something like, oh, I'm in a, I'm in a pickle. I'm in a difficult situation. Please help me. And the context and my facial expression will indicate more of what we need to know. Um, formulaic sentences like out of sight, out of mind are old sayings or some other structures that have become idiomatic expressions but do not follow this classical <coughs> um, clause, uh, the, clause class, the classical clause structure. And clausal sentences have subjects and predicates. And I have given you here an example of a simple sentence containing just one main clause. This is a sentence. Hang on, where's my cursor? There it is, here. <laughs> and then I have given you a complex sentence, a compound complex sentence, in fact, consisting of a compound clause, Tom loves Sally and Sally loves Tom, plus a long um, sentential relative clause, which in turn contains an adverbial clause. Okay. <clears throat> now, clausal sentences can be analyzed in terms of so-called clause elements. And most grammars distinguish the following elements, subjects, verbs, objects, adverbials, predicate complements, and objective predicates. Now, while they agree that these are the clause elements, they don't always call them clause elements. Some people call them, call them clause constituents, and some people don't say verbs, but verb phrase, and some people say predicate, even though predicate is often also a longer or a bigger unit. Uh, some people don't use the terms predicate complement or objective predicate. Those are rather old-fashioned or traditional terms that are used by my hero, George Kerm. I'll show you. George Kerm wrote this fantastic grammar in two volumes. There's also a one-volume edition of it or version of it. Love Kerm. He was so knowledgeable. Um, so, although people disagree uh, about what to call these elements, um, they work with them. And that's why I like, well, that's one of the many reasons why I like my color parsing method, because it moves us a little bit away from nomenclature and lets us focus on the elements and how they relate to each other. <clears throat> okay, now here are um, three transitive um, sentences or clause patterns. Um, there are three main clause patterns, transitive, intransitive, and link verb patterns. And those can be subdivided into subgroups. And I'm going to give you the most important ones. And if you want to have an overview, go and go to my website and download the freebie, the clause pattern freebie. So an intransitive verb is a verb that does not take on object. An object is the clause element that receives the energy or the action of the verb. When I say, I kicked him, or I love you, or I gave you something, then there is some kind of energy transfer from subject to object. And the object is the receiver of this transfer. And the subject is the sender or whatever. You know, there are many different kinds of, um, of verbs and actions and states that can be denoted, but <clears throat> just um, let's try to keep it simple. So, Transitive verbs on their own do not have objects. And so a sentence like she slept, and remember she slept is a sentence and it's also a simple clause. It's a simple sentence consisting of one main clause and it's a very simple main clause which just has one subject, she and one um, uh, and a simple predicate slept. And in this case, the predicate consists of just the finite verb form in the simple past. 
Now, she lived in Chicago. In Chicago is not an object, but it is actually an obligatory element. Because in order to express the very meaning of lived in the sense of residing, we need an adverbial. And the same is true for the verb move when we want to express changing residences or changing locations of uh, living locations. So the prep phrase in Chicago or, or the prep phrase to Chicago are um, prep phrases functioning as obligatory adverbials. And adverbials are um, elements in a clause that express something about circumstances. There are also other types of adverbials. I'll get to that in another video and I talk about it in my book. <laughs> I don't want you to get tired of hearing that, but I, I want to remind you of it. Um, so there are different kinds of adverbials, but many adverbials express something about circumstances like time and place and manner and um, instrumentation and reason and purpose and what have you. A long list of circumstances that express, you know, um, details about where and how an action took place. Now look at the, the next example, which actually there should be a three and not a four. <laughs> um, don't know what happened. It's one of those automatic things, I suspect. Don't worry about it, and I'll try not to worry about it. So uh, she stared is actually a complete thought. She stared. She um, looked at something intensely. And she stared is an intransitive verb. But we can also add uh, an adverbial of direction. We can add the information of what was stared at. And now when we do that, we have actually two options of parsing the sentence. We can either say that stare is our verb and then atom is our prep phrase functioning as adverbial. Or um, we can say that stared at is a phrasal verb and the preposition actually turned this intransitive verb into a transitive verb and that this phrasal verb then takes on a, um, an object. These two ways of, um, actually this is not obligatory, it's just an adverbial. Um, <clears throat> sorry, you know what, I went through these slides so many times and you keep overlooking things, don't you? So um, she stared at him Two ways of seeing it, either intransitive verb plus prep phrase as adverbial or phrasal verb plus object. Transitive class patterns. Um, to remember the transitive pattern, just remember I love you. You know, I slept is the intransitive pattern. I love you is the transitive pattern. And the subject verb Object pattern is the simplest one and the easiest one. It's also possible to have two objects in a sentence, but I've never seen a verb that takes three objects. So you can have verbs that take just one object. Some verbs take always take two objects and sometimes certain verbs can depending on their meaning, take either two objects or an object in something else or what have you. And I can actually provide some examples if you want them. <clears throat> or you can find them by browsing the dictionary. Um, browsing through the dictionary. Okay, when we have a, have a second object, um, the object, the Sometimes the two objects are sometimes called the direct object and the indirect object, and in German the accusative object and the dative object, but I wouldn't go there. I would simply say two objects. And with the second object, you have two choices of placing it. It can be placed in between the verb and this object. So I gave whom, what, or I can attach 
this, um, this object, which is sometimes called the indirect object, with the help of a preposition and place it in final position. Um, Tom gave a present to Sally. Very often you find that when it is a proper noun, it's placed in, in the inside position. Tom gave Sally a present and Tom gave a present to her. But I don't want to go there. I think you should just observe what people say and just look at the examples in good monolingual dictionaries. Now, some verbs do not require, um, and it do not only require an object, but also require something that says something about either the location of the object or the situation of the object as a consequence of the action expressed in the verb. In this case, the present who has moved to a location where. And some people would say that this is an adverbial of place. But it really complete. It's re, it really predicates something about the um, the location of the object, and so I will stick with the traditional idea idea where the focus is on the functionality of it. So this objective predicate predicates something about the object, namely that the object is on the table. Um, Tom called Sally his treasure. Again, his treasure is not an object, but it is actually. So he called Sally, or Tom said that Sally is his treasure. So this element predicates something about the object, and this predication is related or is a consequence of or is, yeah, is related to the action of the verb. Um, I'll do a video about different nomenclatures, I think. I'll do a video about that, and I definitely talk about that in my book. Try not to get upset about the nomenclature. Stick to the colors <laughs> or to something else or, or, or compare nomenclatures. I think that's also interesting. Link verbs are sometimes called copular verbs. And... Here is this basic pattern. Mary is cute. Tom is a teacher. It was him. To be good is to be happy, etc., etc. Now, traditionally, this is called a predicate complement. This, what the orange bit completes the predicate. Without it, we don't even know which direction the thought is taking. Uh, copular verbs are like equation signs in, a, in an equation. Mary equals cute. Um, so copular verbs don't predicate anything or say anything about uh, an action. They say something about the state of the subject. Um, sometimes you will find that people don't call this a predicate complement, but will say this is a predicate adjective, a predicate noun, a predicate pronoun, a predicate infinitive, etc. They mean the same thing. It is the element following the link verb. And to be is not the only link verb. And some people don't call it a link verb. I don't know why, but I think it is the, um, the most characteristic link verb. But you could also look like um, have verbs like Mary seems nice or... Um, Tom appears to be the teacher, or um, he grew fond of her. You know, there are different kinds of link verbs around. And when you look at a dictionary like this one, it will help you out. It will. I actually forgot whether they call them link verbs or copular verbs. I think they call them link verbs. And, um, you know, there are some verbs like, like grow that can be either link verbs or intransitive verbs or other kinds of verbs. Okay, so these are your basic class elements. Now I already gave you the caveat that these, uh, that all the standard grammars that are commonly used at English departments um, divide the clause up into these types of clause elements, but the nomenclature is different. And sometimes the definitions are also slightly different. 
many modern grammars distinguish between a um, an element that is a bit, they 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 look at the predicate complement in terms of meaning and when the predicate complement says something about the subject they call it either a complement to the subject or a subject predicative um, for example and when the element says something about the location of the subject they call it an uh, a subject related adverbial I do not find that useful because then it steers us too much into the realm of semantics. And although I, I'm not a structuralist in that I say that we can analyze language without taking um, the meaning into account, I think it it is useful to stay functional when it makes sense. And to me, it makes sense here. But that's also a story for another day. And guess where I talk about that. Okay, now, what is a predicate appositive? A predicate appositive is basically a second predicate that has been placed alongside the regular finite predicate. And so, in a way, it looks like a class element, but in a way it isn't. It is, um, it is a second predicate. But it is not a finite one, because one, um, a, a simple class can only have one predicate. And it's a, so it's a finite, uh, it's a non-finite or a verbless predicate that has been placed alongside the other predicate. And the tricky thing is that there are movable and non-movable predicate appositives. Some predicate appositives always need to follow the verb or the obligatory adverbial. Um, if there is an obligatory adverbial. So, and, and some can be moved to initial position and that is a huge topic that i will certainly not deal with in this in this um little presentation um, and i don't want to freak you out i just want you to get used to the predicate depositive first okay um now i I wonder whether I should give you the definition first or I should show you a sentence first. I'll show you a sentence first, in fact, four. Here are examples and then I'll go back to the definition. Here are examples of predicate positives. She returned home drunk and happy. Now, some people might be tempted to call drunk and happy adverbials, but they are not. Drunk and happy doesn't, this element doesn't speak to the verb. It speaks to she. She returned home, she was drunk and happy. So while she returned home, she was drunk and happy. So drunk and happy talks about what she was like while she returned home. And I hope you already noticed, by the way, that I formulated the, um, this other version, while she returned home, she was drunk and happy, or she returned home and she was drunk and happy. You notice that this is not a substructure. Um, this is really a second predicate. And um, the interesting thing is that the predicate appositive is like, is a reduced predicate and that sometimes it replaces a subclass, but sometimes it replaces a main class and sometimes it replaces a superordinate class. And so the predicate appositive can be used in paratactic styles. Uh, don't freak out if you didn't understand this last comment. Um, you'll understand that eventually. But right now, just notice that drunk and happy is an element that's not obligatory. The class would be complete without it, syntactically speaking. She returned home is a complete class. But this predicate positive gives me a two for one option, as it were. I can add, uh, I can predicate something about the subject without adding another clause. So, um, so in a way, it's a second predicate that looks like a clause element. Okay, so in which a mighty will stands paralyzed. This is from a beautiful poem by Rilke, the panther, which was beautifully translated by Stephen Mitchell. You can find it in Wikipedia, and I will actually make 
a video about this poem after this presentation because there are some interesting things happening in the translation. Okay, a mighty will is the subject of the subclass, stands the verb, so the mighty will is paralyzed and it stands somewhere. She was like a bird. So like a bird is a regular predicate complement following the link verb and full of joy and music predicates something about her and also provides the reason why the speaker was tempted to call her a bird. Um, now compare this drunk and happy she returned home would be an option but full of joy and music she was like a bird would not this element here actually explains this and because that is so we could argue that this is, is in fact not a predicate positive but that it is a second predicate complement or that we have ellipsis here that she was like a bird she was full of joy and music. And those are possible ways of seeing the sentence. I think um, one can see it as a predicate positive, and I, otherwise I wouldn't have offered this, um, this interpretation of it or this parsing um, or this reading of it. But I want you to be aware that when we parse something, um, things are often not black and white. And the questions that arise while we parse are always much more interesting than the final version that we choose. They entered the house as friends. Now, they were friends when they entered the house, see? Um, but they left it as enemies. Here we have two prep phrases functioning as predicate positives. And they're not so. Again, these prep phrases don't modify the verb, they speak to the subject, they say something about the subject as they entered the house and left it. Okay, now let's go back to the rule. The predicate positive will have an implied subject, and this implied subject must be identical with the subject of the clause to which the predicate positive has been attached or into which it has been put and you see that this always the the orange bit with the shadow always speaks to the subject and this rule becomes particularly important when you choose to put the predicate positive into initial position now there are different kinds of structures different um the, that can function as predicate positives. That also is a story for another day. And yes, I talk about it in my grammar book. We can't put too much into here. Now I want to juxtapose predicate, predicate complements, predicate positives, and adverbials. Um, let me try to move this out of the way. Sometimes when I move this little window out of the way, um, it doesn't happen in the recording. We'll see what happens. She was drunk and happy. We can all agree that this element follows the link verb and is a predicate complement. She returned home drunk and happy is the sentence that we already saw and, and here we already agreed, I hope. <laughs> well, you couldn't disagree, you couldn't interrupt me, but I hope that you nodded your head when I said this is like a second predicate, but it's an, a verbless one that predicates something about she while she returned home. Now look at this, she ran home as fast as she could, or she ran home fast. Now fast, this as fast as she could, this is an adverb phrase, fast is an adverb here. And this adverb is post modified by a little clause of comparison. And this is, uh, so this adverb phrase contains a little clause of comparison. And together, this element speaks to the verb. So this is indeed an adverbial. And a little side note, when two adverbials, two or more adverbials appear side by side, I often use italics and the shadow function in order to distinguish these two adverbials. These are regular adverbials. Well, this is an adverbial of direction, um, and this is an adverbial of manner. 
And um, so I just put this, use the shadow function and the italics in order to distinguish that these are two. They quickly entered the house. Again, quickly speaks to the verb, and hence it's an adverbial. Some people would argue that quickly is actually part of the verb phrase and that this should be blow, blue if you stick with the color scheme because um, there's a difference between entering and quickly entering. Traditionally, this would be called an adverbial modifier of the verb and um, with quirk, it would be called an adverbial clause element. Story for another day. But we can agree that quickly is an adverb and it speaks to the verb. So it's an adverbial speaking to the verb, not to they. Okay, here are examples of predicate appositives. One in final position, one in medial position, and one in um, a compound one in initial position. He typed away at his manuscript right through the night. It's a complete clause. And then we have a past participle construction as predicate appositive. He was potted on by high ideals and his need for money. And instead of adding the second sentence or clause, we have this predicate appositive. The boys devoured the leftover vegan pizza. That's a complete clause or complete sentence. But then this predicate appositive, the second predicate, has been inserted. Now you could argue that this is a reduced relative clause, non-defining, and in a way it can be called that, but it is a, an adjective phrase. And the question is, what is the function? And it doesn't matter whether it was initially derived, possibly, um, of a non-defining relative clause. And the thing is, you could also place this structure in initial position. You could say, <clears throat> pardon me, the boys devoured the leftover vegan pizza. You could say ravenous after the morning workout, comma, the boys devoured the leftover vegan pizza. In final position, this would not sound good. And here is one consideration. You know, each, every sentence we look at has a sort of architecture, if you will. Uh, and the architecture consists of various components. It has a syntactic arch architecture, it has a sound or rhythmic architecture, and a semantic architecture. And the paragraph, as well as the text in which the sentence finds itself, also has an architecture consisting of these various dimensions. And um, so often it depends on the context of whether we can put a movable element into certain kinds of positions. You know, even if in theory, an initial or final position is open um, to a particular structure, then we still have to look at whether this works well in the context of the text. But before we can analyze texts, like that, we need to understand what elements are available to us. And so that's why I take a text, but I use the text as a springboard, uh, use the sentence as a springboard for paragraph and text analysis and also for writing instruction. Okay, so I must admit I don't remember where these two sentences were taken from. I think this was from Miles and Burton Nosko's great book. And um, and this one, I don't remember at all. And this one is a sentence that I changed somewhat. It's from um, Ken Burns' great series on the Civil War. Or actually on the Dust Bowl. That's right. He did a series on the Dust Bowl. Or a great uh, documentary. And the sentence is altered from that. And why I added some more information. Um into the sentence in because you don't have context. Confident that rain would come, unmindful of the power of the prairie winds, the newly arrived farmers plowed mile after mile of virgin soil. So we have two adjective phrases. Confident is an adjective modified by that clause. 
Unmindful is an adjective modified by an off phrase, a prepositional phrase. And these two phrases are used to serve or are serving as predicate depositives. They predicate something about the newly arrived farmers. So the newly arrived farmers were confident that rain would come. The newly arrived farmers were unmindful of the power of the prairie winds. And the newly arrived farmers plowed mile after mile of virgin soil. So this sentence consists of a main clause plus two predicate positives. And in a way, thus it contains three propositions. So predicate positives offer us wonderful ways of condensing prose in very effective ways. And there are different kinds of structures that can be used in that function. And we'll look at, so we already saw we have a past participle construction here. We have our adjective phrases here. And on the next slide, I will give you a sentence taken from um, Hemingway's great short story, The Undefeated. Now I must uh, add as a side note, I hate bullfighting and I support Peter and all other organizations that, um, that fight that. And I will put a link into the description box below where you can see how lovely bulls can be and how much they love to cuddle and how sad it is to kill them. But um, nevertheless, I use Hemingway's short story uh, or I like using it when I teach grammar and writing because it was so well written. I mean, it's a fantastic story as far as language goes and craft goes. Okay, so look at this. This very long sentence, this is a kind of sentence, this type of sentence is sometimes called a cumulative sentence. We have a main clause at the beginning, and then we have an accumulation of substructures or subclauses that then provide more detail. So the, the, the direction or the main, the action, the main action is in the main clause, and then there are details piled on that make us really see. Um, cumulative sentences are very fantastic. Uh, they're great in prose, and they're also fantastic for teaching purposes. <laughs> Now, his feet in his box stirrups is an absolute phrase, story of another day, telling it in my grammar book. <laughs> um, his great legs, uh, his great legs and the buckskin covered armor gripping the horse. This is also an absolute phrase. The reins in his left hand, ditto. The long pick held in his right hand, ditto his broad hat well down over his eyes to shade them from the lights. This is also an absolute phrase. Watching the distant door of the Toral. This is a present participle construction. And both absolute phrases as well as present and past participle constructions can be used as predicate appositives. And for fun, you can actually take these structures and turn them into unreduced clauses and then read out loud what the result sounds like and then you will notice or you will be better able to appreciate the art of this great fantastic sentence and one another little note see how these absolute phrases provide snapshots of the situation and this participle the present participle construction provides a little film clip so <clears throat> these absolute phrases are like little images that we so that help us see what Zurito looks like, and the participle construction shows us Zurito in action. So that's just a little side note. That's I think that's very fascinating. Okay, stand by for more videos and posts, both on my website and on on YouTube. Um, there is so much more stuff, but I hope that I have given you a usable introduction to clause elements and the predicate a positive, which is a very fascinating feature of English. All of this was some, taken from my book, The Joy of Syntax and the Zen of Grammar Practice. And of course, you could buy the book 
And you could also book me for a one-on-one -on -one session. And I offer one-on-ones, often via Zoom or whatever uh, video conference room you like, but I really like Zoom. And I also offer group sessions, so contact me. And that was it. Please subscribe to my channel and share this video with friends if you think they might like it. And I will see you in the next video. Have a nice day. Bye-bye.